Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to the first uh, serious symposium of spring semester 2010. And um, I'm going to be speaking today, uh, Gene Spafford, and I'm going to be presenting a, a talk uh, entitled Thinking Outside the Box. And as I go along, hopefully you'll understand uh, what I mean by the box. So there's a picture of what we sort of wish it was like outside. It's a little bit colder and snowier than that. Um, and this is uh, a talk that has a somewhat US-centric point of view, uh, in at least at, at the per first part. Uh, if we think of national security as it has often been phrased, uh, particularly for the United States, it has been a scene that has been dominated by a certain physical isolation. Uh, we have as a country here uh, great sized oceans on either side of the country and this has limited the ability of uh, other countries to uh, sneak up on the country or to um, move large armies uh, onto the North American continent. Uh, logistics turns out to be a very important part of any kind of military activity and is one of the problems right now in Afghanistan is the resupply chain for some of the troops is uh, stretched very thin and uh, it goes through hostile territory. Uh, but predominantly during the uh, 18th and 19th centuries the United States and the early part of the 20th century the United States uh, exercised a certain amount of self-protection and power projection through the creation of uh, one of the largest navies uh, that has had the world has seen in terms of both size and in power. Now, in starting about uh, 1950, really 1948, there was a transition in this overall geographic picture. Um, before, we had to worry basically about Canada and Mexico, and other than some skirmishes with each, uh, in the um, 17th, 18th centuries, uh, largely they are uh, uh, countries that we don't have a lot of concern on either border. But starting in the 1950s with the development of um, atomic and then nuclear weapons, of uh, long-range strategic bombers, and of uh, missiles, intercontinental ballistic missiles, uh, we had a very different kind of protection profile. Whereas with navies, we could basically match force with force and uh, achieve a certain level of dominance and, and uh, protection. Here we were a case where uh, any single one of these kinds of weapons slipping through defenses uh, would be catastrophic and they were difficult to defend against. So the defense posture changed from one of stand up of a large force to that of stand, uh, uh, building up an adequate force, and some would argue a more than adequate force, so that uh, we would survive a first strike by uh, primarily uh, the Soviet Union was the, the major concern at the time. And uh, I, I suspect from looking at the audience that most of you uh, were born perhaps after the Soviet Union uh, existed. Um, but but this was basically the philosophy, is that if the other side, and they did the same, um, if the other side were to launch an attack, uh, they would not be successful in destroying all of these weapons, and therefore there would be sufficient level for a counterattack that would be devastating in its own form. This became known as a MAD, or Mutually Assured Destruction, and perhaps not really a matter of defense, uh, so much as a matter of massive retribution. It arguably worked because for uh, 60 years we have not had any further use of these weapons other than in testing. Uh, and, and it seems to have, have worked well. But we've seen a further transition now from nation states threatening uh, powers to various kinds of crime. And the crimes uh, involve penetrating the borders with various criminal activities. 
So here's an example that I have uh, with fake handbags. Uh, this is an example of a very large area of crime where in uh, various countries designer or trademarked goods are produced that are counterfeit. Purses, watches uh, are examples that we sometimes hear jokes about or, or otherwise see, but actually there are uh, deeper and potentially more worrisome counterfeiting activities that occur. For example, counterfeits of, of uh, drugs, of medicines, prescriptions. <clears throat> Certainly you've all seen ads, possibly more than you want that you didn't ask for, uh, for pharmaceuticals that you can buy online. Uh, many of those look like and may even be formulated similar to the real prescriptions. But many of them are not. They are filled with, perhaps at the best, uh, a harmless sugar powder. At the worst, possibly with industrial waste. And so if you get those, or if those are mixed in with the regular supply because your pharmacy chain is trying to save money by ordering through an international uh, chain, you may be getting medications that don't do you any good and could in fact be doing you harm. Uh, we know of cases where, uh, for instance, cough syrup that's been manufactured. Uh, one of the primary uh, countries where this has been a problem is uh, through the uh, People's Republic of China, uh, where cough medicine that, been, that has been uh, shipped has actually contained antifreeze and has resulted in the deaths of children who ended up taking the, the cough medicine. Another area where we have problems with counterfeits is in electronic parts that are specified as having certain tolerances for use in high precision equipment such as aircraft. Uh, and then it turns out that the parts that come in look like the vendors, may have all of the markings of the vendor, but have used recycled, cheap, or counterfeit parts that fail. Uh, one notable case that uh, the FBI investigated found a whole set of uh, boards that looked like they were from Cisco Corporation that had counterfeit parts and when they were plugged into the systems they were supposed to work in, they would uh, short out and cause fires. Uh, not a particularly good thing to want to have happen. So counterfeiting in various forms is more than simply an economic crime. It can actually have other kinds of results. Um, human trafficking is not as large a crime in the sense of dollar amounts, but in various parts of the world it is a very significant problem and certainly the parties involved uh, who are victimized by this uh, and has a very, very big impact on their lives that dollar amounts certainly don't, don't cover. Um, uh, one of the bigger problems right now with some of the human trafficking that occurs in Southeast Asia, the Middle East, some of South America, is that the victims are actually children uh, rather than adults. And so um, usually, but not always, usually the victims are uh, young girls uh, sometimes as young as six or seven years old, uh, who are either kidnapped or sometimes are actually uh, uh, taken from their families under pretext of uh, getting a job in the city, wherever that is, or uh, sometimes are actually even sold by their parents because in different cultures, uh, children, uh, particularly female children, don't have quite the same value to the families as male children. And uh, uh, then they're shipped to various places around the world. Um, one of the uh, underground kinds of problems has to do with narcotics uh, of various kinds across borders. And one could certainly argue that, well, you know, what's a little, what's a little of this or that uh, that somebody uses being a problem? Well, the difficulty here is that it is very, very big business to smuggle uh, and manufacture these kinds of drugs across borders the primary source of income for the Taliban uh, in Afghanistan is selling opium, uh, opium poppies. That's where they make most of their money and they use that to go back and buy uh, bombs, guns, and other kinds of things. Uh, the cartels in Mexico for 30, 20, 30 years were bribing local officials to let them transship drugs through the country of Mexico into the United States and onto Europe. Starting a few years ago, the uh, drug gangs had sort of maxed out 
what they were able to get in terms of funding and U.S. increased pressure on anti-narcotics efforts. So they began to branch out and violated the implicit contract with the bribed officials and started selling to the Mexican population and committing additional crimes such as kidnapping for ransom. <clears throat> this resulted in uh, pushback by the Mexican government, as one might expect. Um, and if you've been following the news, it is in some places in Mexico uh, effectively a state of war where the government has the army patrolling the streets and everybody who is in the police force and local government has been arrested on corruption charges. There have been multiple cases, if you go out and look in the news, where when drug traffickers have been arrested, uh, the their gangs or, or uh, others associated with them will attempt to liberate them from local jails by showing up in a convoy of armored vehicles with uh, artillery and automatic weapons that outgun the army. And uh, if, they can't, if they can't get them out of jail, they'll kill everybody just to make sure there's no witnesses left. Uh, one national scandal that occurred a few weeks ago is a, a Mexican commando team uh, went to take uh, as a prisoner one of the, uh, one of the major drug uh, cartel leaders. He was killed in the shootout and shortly thereafter, um, after at his, I believe it was at his funeral or his wake, um, his mother, wife, children, and, and others were killed in retribution uh, by the drug gangs. So, you know, these are not nice people, and it's all driven by money. Uh, so, uh, so that's another area where crime is a problem, and that's beginning to leak, leak over the, the uh, um, southwestern U.S. borders. Uh, a number of indictments have been handed down recently for uh, some of the customs uh, and Border Patrol personnel who have been bribed uh, on the U.S. side. Arms trafficking. Well, a lot of these groups can't function unless they've got uh, ammunition and firearms, many of which are banned from use in uh, their countries or banned for sale, particularly automatic weapons, artillery. Uh, uh, you know, when the, when the drug gangs are, are equipping themselves with, with ground-to-air missiles uh, and uh, uh, actual artillery, uh, that's not a good thing. Where are they getting it from? Well, they're getting it from the arms dealers. That's an international form of, of crime that's a problem. Uh, piracy. Somalia is not the only place where piracy is occurring. It's one of the places where we certainly see it in the news. But this also is a criminal enterprise that combined with not simply seizing the ships for ransom, but sometimes seizing ships uh, for the cargo or seizing the ships for the ships. Uh, this has been a problem in the Caribbean. It's not normally talked about, but particularly for some of the faster boats, uh, uh, there aren't a lot of people who just exercise pleasure craft from island to island anymore because they may be taken over, tied to the anchor and thrown overboard, and their boat used for smuggling because it hasn't previously been registered as a criminal enterprise for that, for that vessel. Um, so all of these are, are, are really unpleasant things that are going on that are not military activities, but they are transnational activities. They go across porous borders because once we believe that we're safe from a nation state threat, one of the things that we want to encourage is commerce. And that means we need to open the borders to various individuals. And this uh, has resulted in the next step, uh, which is the sort of the terrorist connection. And uh, so not only are the criminals coming in to make money, but now we also are seeing ideologic um, groups taking advantage of the openness of various countries and their borders to pursue a political agenda. <clears throat> and basically, terrorists are criminals. Um, this is an area where you will find a lot of political debate. But terrorists are basically criminals. What they do are things that are against the law in the country where they carry out those activities. So if we had someone come into this country and attempt to do arson or robbery, that would be a criminal act. Coming in and setting off explosives is a criminal act. And it's not necessarily people from outside. So one of the interesting statistics, if you look at it, from uh, 1900 to 2000 in the US, 260 people were killed during that century in acts of domestic terrorism. And almost, uh, um, Two-thirds were by one person, by Timothy McVeigh in Oklahoma City um, in May 19, 1995. 
And that's the Murrah office building, uh, or what's left of it, after he set off his truck bomb. Uh, what really brought it to the attention uh, uh, in the U.S. more than anything else was the September 11th incident uh, that I'm sure everybody knows about. And on that particular occasion, almost 3,000 people were killed in, in three coordinated attacks. Now, it's interesting to note the national response to that particular act. Whoops. Yeah, that's a problem there. Um, <clears throat> So we traced it back to al-Qaeda uh, in Afghanistan, which historically, by the way, uh, the United States CIA created. Um, al-Qaeda al was a force that we uh, did a lot to bring together and arm and train so that they could form Mujahideen to fight against the Russians who were then in Afghanistan. Uh, well, not the Russians, really, but the USSR. Um, and... Um, so they were armed and militant and organized. And when we um, had the first war in Iraq and developed permanent basing in Saudi Arabia, uh, this was viewed as an affront to the very highly uh, religious um, individuals who were behind al-Qaeda. And we became, the US and the West became the uh, new enemy. Um, we went on and we ended up invading Iraq, a, a country that was completely in, uninvolved with al-Qaeda. and. If we look at the numbers, and I'm not going to go into a, a lot of detail here, it's just interesting to think about. Uh, we've spent over $2 trillion uh, in, from the U.S. alone. Uh, over 5,000 U.S. service personnel have died in Afghanistan and Iraq. And based on uh, best estimates from U.N., um, British Public Health, a few others, over a million people have been kill, uh, killed, missing, injured, or maimed in those two countries. Um, and unfortunately, this doesn't clear correctly. But what that works out is $675 million in expense per US victim of the 9-11 attacks. Um, about two military deaths for each victim, 334 foreign civilian casualties per uh, victim, um, and radicalization of more terrorists. Now the question, of course, is, is that the right response? Well, it depends on who you're asking. Um, if you were to ask Osama bin Laden, you would say that's exactly the right response because this is the kind of reaction they were trying to provoke. And here's a, here's a quote from one of his writings. That uh, um, all that we have to do is send two Mujahideen to the furthest point east with a flag on which is written the words Al-Qaeda, and the Americans will panic and send a general and an army there and engage in military operations which cost them blood and money and political capital, and then we'll just do it again. So, brothers, we're pursuing the, strategic of bleeding, uh, the strategy of bleeding the United States to exhaustion and bankruptcy. Um, recent events sort of follow in line with this. The, the uh, underwear bomber, um, who did not succeed with what he was doing and probably couldn't have succeeded. He was probably planted specifically to get people upset. He didn't know that. But, uh, for instance, he spent 20 minutes in the, in the uh, airplane bathroom before coming out to try to set off the bomb with a chemical concoction that anybody who had studied the chemistry would know wouldn't work. If he really was trying to bring the plane down and didn't want interference, he would have tried to set it off in the restroom pressed up against the wall. Why did he come out in the passenger compartment? So he'd be seen. So it would help spread additional panic. And we've fallen for it. If you look at what's happened to international air travel uh, and otherwise, we have further um, uh, indulged in, in, in tremendous economic damage uh, to the airline industry uh, as, an over, as probably an overreaction to that event. Um, so let's put this in some perspective because this is important. If we're going to talk about security, we should think about risk benefit. In the U.S. alone, over 400,000 people will die this year from smoking. So if we're concerned about the lives of residents of this country, we should probably invade Kentucky and North Carolina because they're clearly bigger threats uh, than, than anywhere else. 
over 600,000 will die from heart disease. So we should put up controls around each and every McDonald's and Burger King. Um, in 2001, the year of the 9-11 uh, attacks, over 20,000 people died in car crashes because they didn't wear a seat belt. More than that died in car crashes. But 20,000 were, were believed to have been preventable deaths if they'd only worn their seat belts. And that's seven times more than 9-11 total. And have we seen um, any kind of war on seat belts or, or, or not seat belts or, or any other kind of major activity? If you look at this, our perception as a nation of what risk in it is and how we react to it is significantly skewed by the rarity of the event and, in some sense, the intensity of the event. Lots of little incidents that occur on a regular basis hardly make the news. It's the rare big events that really get people upset and scared. Because it's a rare event, they don't know how to uh, cope with it. They don't know what to do with it. It turns out that uh, with the number of miles flown, the number of, of uh, plane departures, even including every terrorist incident that's occurred over the last 40 years, uh, you are in more danger probably, uh, depending on how far away from campus you live, driving home today than you would be getting on board a plane. The likelihood of you dying in a terrorist attack at any point in the next decade is vanishingly close to zero, simply because it is so rare and the controls are in place. And yet, we have so many people who are afraid of, of uh, flying or are afraid of further terrorism incidents. Um, this says something uh, to some extent about the politics of fear and priorities. In the United States, the Department of Defense has over 2 million people working for it. The State Department and the U.S. Agency for International Development combined have a total of 10,000 people. So the one group is to go out and protect us or, and or flatten things. The other group is international relations and building up uh, international goodwill. The Department of Defense budget, $700 million. That is larger than the defense budget of every other country in the world combined. Um, the U.S. Departments of Justice, Science, Foreign Affairs, all of state, and Education, their combined budget is $100 billion a year. So, again, without saying too much either way, um, this gives a sense of a national prioritization of various kinds of things. Uh, and it is driven in part uh, by this sense of fear and the unusual. We see ignorance every day. We see uh, car crashes every day. Those are, we see people smoking, maybe not every day, but, but frequently. Those don't particularly worry us. But those rare incidents of any kind of terrorism or military action does scare us. Oops. Interestingly, that $100 billion is also about what we're losing in the, in the U.S. alone every year due to cybercrime and fraud. And there's another number because it happens in small amounts on a regular basis. We don't pay attention to it. It isn't viewed as a problem. But if you think about it, that criminal activity is bleeding from the economy, from, from all of us who are, who are residing here, an amount equal to everything spent in the country on uh, federal law enforcement, the court system, all of science, research, and education, everything in education K through 12, and everything that we do in foreign affairs and foreign aid. And criminals are taking at least that much out of the economy. And what's being done? So the, the point of all this is that uh, the national posture is generally to make a minimal investment to a crisis. This is the way that we operate as a society. Uh, and the focus is almost always on an overwhelming military response. Uh, we seek to patch rather than address root causes. So what we're trying to do is go out and uh, whack the terrorists rather than to invest in the things that might change their behavior uh, in the first place. Um, that, that would be another interesting thing for any of you who who are interested in following this is uh, try to find any public discussion of why uh, those terrorists are 
executing what they're doing? And has there been any public debate about how to change their behavior by changing some of the causes? You will be very hard pressed to find anything that discusses that. Instead, it's all response to the threat. But this is not surprising if you look at how we respond to cigarettes. We don't eliminate tobacco. Instead, we invest untold uh, billions in cancer research and heart disease research. And in cybercrime, instead of going back and fixing the fundamental problems, we invest in patching and response, and even then, not very much. <clears throat> so if we look at the state of cybersecurity, almost everybody claims that it's OK, um, that at least outside of Homeland Security, everything's in a, in a green state, which presumably means that it's OK. <clears throat> so if this is the current state, but we look at uh, the major companies are reporting over 15,000 new instances of malware per day. Uh, over 10,000 hosts per day, new hosts join botnets that are being used for sending spam and denial of service. Thousands of email uh, phishing and 25% um, to 50% growth in security incidents uh, every year for at least a decade. This is considered green. This is considered OK and normal because it is a slow, steady, distributed kind of attack. And, and really the argument here, the, the point I'm trying to make with all of this is this is potentially a bigger threat but to our safety and one could argue civilized society, but it is uh, not observed as well because it isn't an impulse rare kind of attack. It is a slow, steady kind of behavior. And I, I would also contend, from my viewpoint, things are getting worse. Uh, over the last 15 years, really nothing related to overall information security has gotten better, except maybe the market for security products. And there are issues with consumer confidence. Uh, today, the news breaking about uh, Google and 20 other major companies uh, being attacked and infiltrated by unknown parties, but implicating the, the government of the People's Republic of China, uh, not necessarily for anything to do with uh, stealing information for money, but for finding information about those who are protesting against the government of the People's Republic of China. Uh, so these are, these are motivations. The, the problems when our major international corporations uh, are being subject to attack uh, by nation states it's, it's uh, become a, a, a major problem. So <clears throat> I would say that, oops, the um, summed up, uh, I've been using this for a few years, that there's this phrase that was attributed to, to Albert Einstein that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And it's not really Einstein. And unfortunately, uh, I'm supposed to, it was supposed to blank that out for a transition. But there's an English playwright by the name of John Dryden, uh, and, and he uh, actually was the one who said this first uh, in his play, The Spanish Friar, back in the 1600s. Um, so what I'd like to talk about for about the next 20 minutes are just to give you a really quick uh, intro to a few things that I think could make a difference. And part of that is by not doing the same things over and over. Um, that We've fallen into a pattern where we kind of accept this gradual uh, growth in problems. We get patches to problems we see after they've occurred, apply the patches, do the same things, buy the same kind of products, get another set of violations, apply another set of patches, and this cycle is just continued for a very long time. That is not taken us to a point of safety and robust systems. So how can we do things differently? How can we break out of that cycle? Well, I think part of it is by looking at computing itself and breaking out of the ruts, breaking out of the boxes that we've arbitrarily put ourselves into. Part of this has to do with the fact that computing itself has really changed over 50 years, but we haven't acknowledged that in any kind of major way. Uh, the diagram for Moore's Law is one that some of you have seen, or at least you've heard of Moore's Law. And Moore's law basically says that the density of the number of transistors per chip goes up, uh, up uh, logarithmically um, over time. And if you plot out the number of transistors on what Intel has released as an example of chips, 
and you've seen that this is in fact the case. That way back in the uh, early 1970s, the first IC chips that were out, the 4004s, only had a few hundred transistors on them. And now we're up into the uh, uh, billions of transistors uh, for dual core processors. Um, let's see. Yeah. So, <clears throat> 10 quintillion is a pretty large number. 10 to the 18th. Uh, even our federal deficit isn't up quite that far yet. 10 quintillion. To give you an idea, worldwide, there were 10 quintillion grains of rice harvested in 2004. That's all the rice harvested everywhere. China, Korea, Indonesia, the US, Brazil, Africa, all the rice everywhere, 10 quintillion grains. Now, I can't tell you it's exactly 10 quintillion because there wasn't anybody sitting down and counting them, but this is the, the figure from looking at the, the tonnage and the average number of grains per ton and so on. Why 2004 is interesting is because that was the first year that more t than 10 quintillion transistors were manufactured in the world. And every year since then, we have manufactured more transistors and put them to market than we have harvested grains of rice. So the number of transistors, the amount of computerization has gone up and is continuing to go up at a really huge rate from almost zero, well, zero in 1956 up to um, many quintillion now. Um, and I lost somewhere in here. There was a um, an issue about the cost too. The cost has dropped. Um, uh, the transition didn't work on this on this slide set. But um, back in 1958, when the um, IBM Stretch was introduced and was an all transistor computer, uh, the transistors were approximately two dollars a piece. Now we're at the point where they're about one five hundred thousandth of a cent a piece. It's a, a drop in price by ten or, uh, seven orders of magnitude in 50 years. And if we go to look at disk storage, <clears throat> back in that 1958 time frame, um, disk storage was about 2,000 bits per cubic inch, about 10 cents per byte in current dollars. Uh, in 2008, when I originally uh, did the research on this, um, storage was about 425 gigabits per cubic inch, 20 cents per gigabyte. That's another factor of seven decrease in cost and a, de and a, and a uh, density increase of 10 to the eighth. So all of that has been a change in, in storage and processing capabilities. Oops, got the right button here. So here's something to consider. The picture down there on the left is a 1959-1960 era computer system. You had a building that was specially uh, fitted with air conditioning and power for it. <clears throat> you had these huge bays all the way around the walls and tapes and uh, uh, punch cards in the center. <clears throat> that was a state-of-the-art supercomputer in 1959-1960. What's on the right is a picture of a Hallmark greeting card, one of the ones that if you open it up you can record a message on the inside in the computer and it plays it karaoke style with some music in the background that you can go buy at one of the Hallmark stores for about $7.95. That greeting card has more processing power and memory than the computer on the left does. And the computer on the left costs about the equivalent of $2 million in today's dollars. So in 50 years, we've gone from $2 million to under $10. From a room requiring special conditioning and protection down to a card you can buy in a store. Many of you, most of you, um, are going to be around in 50 years, unless the Mayans were right. Uh, and you might think, what is computing going to be like in 50 more years? If we've seen this change in the last 50, what are the next 50 going to bring? What I'd like to ask is, if we've had all these changes in computing, why are we still writing software and uh, using some of the same structures that we did 50 years ago. Part of it is because we're locked in this loop where you buy hardware, 
it's got lots of extra capabilities and you start loading it up with software and the vendors produce the next generation of software that does lots more stuff runs on the same hardware uh, but now the new hardware is sluggish because you're doing all these extra things so you have to get the next generation of hardware but when you get that next generation of hardware you're not going to equip it with all new software because you paid for all this old software and all your data is there and all your old programs so you just migrate it over and now you've got extra capacity to be filled by the vendors so we're in this loop we're kind of stuck because of this incrementalism and we don't break out of it unless we think explicitly about breaking out of it and I'll give some examples I'm not going to have enough time to go through everything I have here but an example is the von Neumann architecture <clears throat> prior to von Neumann's insight computer programs were written with wires I've actually programmed like this yeah I'm that old um, and, and basically what you did is you, you took boards that slid into the computer and using plugs you wired in the paths for the data for the registers for the operations and what would happen is it would gate signals through the boards and through the wires and that's how it would do the, uh, the uh, calculation and you programmed it uh, on the fly as you needed with wires von Neumann having the idea that well gosh data could be executed if we interpreted it a different way was a breakthrough we no longer had to play with the wires we simply had to put the right set of bits in memory and let the computer go through and execute but along the way we have come up with problems that are used at least in security to violate our systems buffer overflows lead to data being executed as code and if that data is carefully crafted it can violate our security uh, we have code faults when memory is accidentally overwritten by programs that, that otherwise go crazy. And so the question I have is, can we get better results by segregating memory, by not treating every memory location as executable? What can we do by putting something other than a uniform memory architecture in place? Can we do things differently? Another example, paging was invented uh, for the first time, well, used in the first time on the Ferranti Atlas machine in 1961. And there's a little picture of it. Uh, because back then, memory was expensive. It was done as uh, usually ferrite magnetic cores uh, on a wire grid or sometimes mercury delay lines. Um, I'm not going to describe those, but if you're interested, you can try looking online with a search engine for a mercury delay line and find out how that worked as short term memory. Today, most systems support memory uh, paging. It's built in. But do you need it? Um, if you're like most users and you're only running a few applications, you can have four, eight gig of memory in your, in your uh, main memory, and you don't need to page. You've got all the memory you need for the, what you're running. Samsung just announced a 32 gigabyte chip, a single chip that will fit inside a cell phone or a computer with 32 gigabytes on a single chip. Uh, how much paging are you going to uh, have in place there? Uh, so, so the question is, why do we have all that extra hardware and software complexity in place if most of the time we don't need to page? Uh, programming. Once upon a time, we didn't do bounds checking or type checking because it was expensive. It made the compilations longer, and in some cases, the compilers wouldn't even fit in memory because that extra code took up too much space. So we didn't put in things like preconditions and postconditions and recovery blocks and assertions and, and other things that have been proven time after time to produce better code. How many of you program using pre-assertions and post-assertions? Any of you? How many of you have ever been taught what a pre-assertion and a post-assertion is? See, it's not even in the textbooks. It's not in the classes because we've grown this culture of not using them despite it being shown that this is how you produce highly reliable code. So why do we still do that? The original story that I heard is that in the C compiler that Dennis Ritchie uh, had, was porting, um, they had left out the checking for type checking and bounds checking because the whole compiler had to fit in 32K of memory. 32K. No, I'm, that's, that's not the MRG you're familiar with. That's 32,000 bytes of memory. The whole compiler had to fit. And if they included the, the bounds checking, it overflowed the memory. 
So they built a separate program under Unix called Lint. And Lint had all the checking for the type checking and the bounds checking. They still had it, but it was a separate program. But over time, what happened is people began to use Lint less and less and simply use the language without those features and grew to be accustomed to being without those features. And that's where we are today. We don't use a lot of the language features. And in fact, if we include those, people go, well, it'll make things slower. With millions of gates, with systems that are now clocked in gigahertz, what does that mean to be slower when you're more confident that the programs aren't going to fail or be taken over? We concentrate so much on the speed, we've lost sight of the quality of what we're producing. Stacks. Prior to 1961, prior to the Algol 61, all procedure calls were static. You did a jump and store. When you went to call a routine, you would jump to that location, store your return address in memory at the beginning of the routine, execute the code, and then do a jump in direct back through the beginning of the code. Couldn't do recursion because the second time you called, you'd overwrite the return address of the first time. Algol 61 used stacks to be able to allow recursion. But why do we have only a single stack? What could we do if we had 10 stacks, 20 stacks? Uh, if we had d uh, displays of stacks, could we program things in a different way that would give us some kind of benefit that we don't currently have? Shared libraries. Shared libraries came up in large part because if you had 20 programs that were all using the same library and the library was not changed, uh, you were wasting that space effectively by having duplicates of something that didn't change. So shared libraries came into play because memory was expensive. Well now memory's cheap and many of the attacks against systems are involved with loading new shared libraries so that all the programs are accessing bogus code. Can we do it some other way? Why aren't we thinking about doing it some other way? Uh, <clears throat> testing. We want to thoroughly test software to make sure it's correct. And there are a lot of different methods that have been explored in the literature and over time. Symbolic execution is one. Uh, DU path testing, which is the define use track testing. Mutation analysis is one that I'll mention here that I was involved in. Um, and so the mutation concept is you've got a line like this in your program. So the, the, the variable is equal to an initial value plus a, a constant times a, a variable minus another variable. Well, the idea behind mutation is that as you're programming, you may have made a small, subtle mistake that fits into a common set of mistakes and written the wrong statement that's hard to find. So you may have uh, accidentally put a minus instead of a plus, or maybe you put a divide instead of a times, or maybe you... Uh, uh, use the wrong variable in a place because they both started with I and you got them confused because you're having a bad day. Um, or you got some of them in the wrong order or so on. I mean there's a whole set. I think I've got one more. No, that's the one. That's the one there. So the idea behind mutation is we'll take your original program and for every statement we'll generate all of these mutants, all of these little slight variations and make you generate test data that is going to distinguish between each of the slightly different versions and the original program. If your test data is complete enough to distinguish all of the variants from the real one, then you must have a complete data set. And if your program runs completely on that test data set, then we have high confidence it's correct. <clears throat> um, so in mutation testing, as it was called, the goal was to build these, these programs. It was a very interesting terminology. Um, <clears throat> some of our early funding at one point was the Atomic Energy Commission of Canada was interested in this and mutation testing their control code for their power plants. But oddly, people for the Atomic Power Commission didn't like us talking about mutants for some reason. Um, the problem with mutation analysis is it was time consuming. It took a lot of memory because we were executing on serial processors. It took a lot of time. But now, clusters are cheap. We can take thousands of machines at a time. And with, with uh, fast memory, fast uh, uh, multiple cores, um, threads are a basic construct. 
will it take as much time? Again, what's cost compared to knowing that your program is correct and that someone isn't going to subvert it? The all-in-one operating system. Uh, you're all familiar with probably one of these or multiple of these. Um, operating systems are there to provide a standard interface and controlled sharing. But what if we didn't need to share? Could we do without the operating system entirely? That's, that's where a lot of the problems come from. Could we get away with it? And before you say no, think that all of these systems don't have an operating system in them. 98% of all the computers in the world do not use an operating system in any sense familiar to, to, uh, to you unless you've done real-time programming. Real-time and embedded systems don't need an operating system. That's the majority. The place where we have most of the problems, however, are the ones with operating systems. So why not use multiple processors? Instead of time slicing and doing the mail on one and, and doing the web browsing on another and doing the file system, uh, doing them all on one with separate processes, let's split them out into separate processors and do mail on one, file system on one, security on another one, and connect them together. This is an approach that we took um, with our pilot uh, uh, serious project, uh, Poly Squared, here at Purdue, uh, funded by the NSF. Minimization uh, is also enhanced by that kind of approach because we don't need a full file system and disk for every process. Some of those things have no state that needs to be saved, like the routing table in memory. You need one or two initialized values, and from then on, everything is dynamic and built in memory. There's no reason to swap. There's no reason for file systems. And there's, therefore, nothing that you can plant there as a virus or as a means of taking control. There's a lot of other candidates that are out here. File systems, language design, databases, all of which currently are based on old designs that date back to the 50s and 60s and maybe early 70s. We haven't really thought about how those could change with modern systems and a new view of what we do with, with uh, security. Okay, so, so you've all seen that. Oh, gee. Anyhow, the, 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 order, uh, the order of complexity actually means that equation on the bottom. That you put for some constants, you can bound the execution time or space. And we use big O notation to hide those B's and C's and A's. Um, but if you have an algorithm where those B's and C's and A's are the right values and N has a limit, you can actually turn these on their head. But we don't teach that well. So we talk about you don't want to use an, o, uh, an, an order N squared or an order uh, exponential if you can use linear because linear is better but only for certain numbers. There are some algorithms where you could actually get better performance because you know the upper bound on the algorithms. We've traditionally made these trade-offs on space and time based on generalities and based on small machines. How could things change if we revisited those ideas? So the point here to conclude with is we have a lot of computational power that's changed over the years. We have a lot of interesting problems ahead of us. We have to stop reacting violently to incidents. We have to stop reacting with patches and response to problems and go back to asking, well, what causes these and how can we change those? What assumptions are we making that may be wrong or changed? How can we solve the underlying problem rather than responding to the problem? But I will note in closing here that uh, some results take time. And this is one of my favorite examples of this. Uh, this is um, at the um, University of Queensland in Australia. Uh, the material there that, that's broken is actually a liquid. It's, it's a, a coal pitch. It looks like it's very hard, but it really is liquid. And what happened about 90 years ago is that they put some of that liquid in the funnel on the left in the bell jar. And that right now it's got a web camera. There's the URL. Um, and you can watch that. If you do a Google or something on pitch drop, you'll find it. Um, in, a, in 90 years, I believe it is, they've only had three drops that have actually successfully dropped out of the funnel into the, into the beaker. 
From this, they've been able to calculate the viscosity, which is something that you couldn't do in a time, in a space of a year or five years. It took 50 years before they had two drops necessary to be, actually be able to calculate that. So not all things can be done quickly, and that's another thing we have to get away from is the idea of the quick fix. Some things take time before we can get the best results. So hopefully this gives you some ideas and may inspire you to think a little outside the box, uh, to think of some new ideas, particularly if you're doing research. And, and remember, it's not the enemies outside the gates necessarily. It's the enemies within that we've let in. It's our complacency. It's our willingness to allow small, gradual losses to continue. It's not a military problem. It's a civilian problem. These are not issues that are going to be solved by law enforcement. They're not going to be solved by the military. The computing problems we face are ones that we've caused and we're going to have to address by changing the way we build systems and buy systems. You're specialists, or will be. You're part of the frontline defenses in this arena. Hopefully you'll go out there and make a difference. And with that, I'm done. I'll open it up for some questions, if you've got them, or comments. Uh, I would ask uh, that if I call on you to uh, press the, uh, the little push button on the microphone in front of you on the table so the red light comes on um, so that your, your questions will be recorded. So anybody have any questions or comments? I, I realize that was a lot of material thrown at you rather quickly. but um, Stunned silence. No? All right, well, uh, we have uh, a speaker for next Wednesday. The website is uh, www.serious.purdue.edu slash sexsem, as in security seminar. Uh, you can see the schedule there. You can also see previous years, previous semesters, lectures, available as streamed, downloadable um, podcasts or shockwave displays that you can bring up in a web browser. This one will be available in about a week uh, if you want to listen to it again. Uh, you're in need of sleep or, or otherwise. Um, and we will uh, put all of these um, as possible up on the web. We've occasionally had speakers whose employers do not allow it to be broadcast. But most of the time we put those uh, lectures up on the web and you're welcome to download and listen to them at any time. And uh, once again, if you've registered for the class, you have to sign in every week, the sign-in sheet's at the front, and otherwise, I'll see some of you tomorrow and the rest of you next week. Thanks.